Welcome to Washington Policy on the Go. My name is David Bose. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center. Today, we're going to talk about the comments from the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Reichdahl, as uh, far as wanting to end the uh, state learning assessment. We'll talk with Lee Finn, our Education Director, about that. We'll also talk about the governor's negotiations on union compensation. We'll talk about them because they're not transparent. They're being conducted in secret. What is he agreeing to? Uh, we'll talk with Jason Mercier, our Center for Government Reform Director, about that coming up as well. Then um, uh, we're going to start with a conversation with our Initiative on Agriculture Director, Pam Lewis, and regarding uh, some of the issues with drought. It's July after all. We're finally talking about dry weather uh, in Washington State. I guess East, East Side's been talking about it a bit longer, but we'll talk with her about some of the misconceptions and problems we have in that area. I want to remind you, we changed formats a little while ago, so you can ask questions at any time. Put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the side of your screen, depending on how you've got Zoom um, uh, set up. Um, we'll ask those questions. We'll bring the center directors on. I'll try and, and bring those questions to them during that conversation, uh, because once I drop them off, uh, it's done. Um, and we'll, that way we can get the questions in, in the same uh, compartment, compartmentalized uh, portion of the show um, to help help you if you ever want to go back and and uh, uh, access what you learned or you want to show someone a portion of that video, you can. I also want to remind you to check out our blog uh, on a daily basis, WashingtonPolicy.org, uh, because there's new information there all the time, and center directors are, are breaking new information, uh, as well as our new uh, policy studies are available there at WashingtonPolicy.org. Sign up for our free e-newsletter, which comes out on Fridays and uh, brings you all the links and information that you need to know and encapsulated in that week as well. I'd like to bring forward our initiative on agriculture director, uh, Pam Lewison, now uh, to talk about a couple of different things. Let's start with um, the study we'll be releasing tomorrow on drought. You know, one of the interesting things that you point out, and this is something that's bothered uh, some friends of mine on the, that live on the east side who said, hey, why is this area being described as uh, under drought? This is a friend of mine near Leavenworth out in the mountains. Why is it being described as a drought when it's been raining torrentially and we've had this record rainfall and we've got a, a healthy snowpack despite claims to the contrary? Why would that be called a drought? So why don't you describe for us, you know, some of the misconceptions about what a drought is and how it's actually defined. So drought in Washington state, we'll start with that, is defined as, um, surface water that is in a given area um, being less than 75% of normal. So when we talk about surface water, we're talking about things like ponds, rivers, streams, those sorts of things. And um, drought designations in Washington are different than they are in some other places. So drought emergencies actually in Washington state this year, the drought emergency is specific to three areas. Um, so in Leavenworth, for example, there is no drought emergency this year. Um, but what they're talking about is access to surface water and whether or not that surface water is going to last for the entire water season. Uh, and our water season is really long. So it goes from approximately March all the way through until we get that fall rain in October or November. Uh, so it's there's a lot of other things that make it more complicated, but that's the short version. And why does it matter? I mean, how, how the, the, the droughts defined there? I mean, if we're getting the record rainfall and we've got the good snowpack, you know, why, um, why should we be concerned about those other things? And is it uh, solely an ag issue or does it expand into uh, other areas of interest as well? So sometimes it is primarily an ag issue, but if you look at like last, year, for example, virtually everywhere had some sort of drought issue associated with it, including parts of Western Washington. In fact, uh, last year, I believe the only areas where there wasn't a drought issue were in King and Pierce counties. So drought is something that can affect every part of Washington state, but particularly the things that you look at are um, mostly ag, but also municipal water sources and when um, you have places where people want to have nice green verdant lawns or they want to have um, their gardens in particular have access to water, drought becomes a real concern if we have a, a short snowpack or we have a lack of rainfall 
Uh, and last year we had a combination of both, which is why we had a drought emergency that was declared for effectively the entire state. So uh, one of the things that you recommend, well, I should actually remind people that uh, at, when we say just agriculture, um, ag is what the, the third or fourth uh, economic engine in the state, uh, depending on which year you're counting. Yeah, it, right. it competes. It goes anywhere from the second to the fourth, depending yeah. on what else is going on. Right. So, you know, from from number two biggest to the fourth biggest, somewhere in there, um, that means what happens in agriculture in Washington State matters to you also. Uh, even if you are not, you know, the only thing you're doing is buying produce at the store, these things uh, do matter to you. You just don't notice them. Uh, so, I should correct myself on on that as as well. Um, but you made a, an interesting recommendation in the study that comes out tomorrow. One of the things that you go through is the process for an official drought declaration. And there's two committees that meet. And then after you know, one recommends to the other, the other looks at it. And then they send that off to the governor. Uh, describe that, that process for us. So it can actually be a really long process to have a drought declaration um, come out. And I, my thought is that it really doesn't need to be that long. Uh, I'd really like to see these two committees sort of join forces a little bit, uh, particularly if we suspect there might be a drought. And uh, when I say we, what I really do mean is agriculture, because uh, farmers are really close to the situation at hand. And I, I would venture to say that they are, in fact, the first people to say, hey, things look really dry out here. Um, I think that we might have a situation. Uh, so much so uh, that last year, wheat growers were the very first people to call out to the state. Um, and I mean that in every sense of the word, uh, sort of begging for a drought declaration. They in fact called out for it very early and said, hey, um, dry land farmers do not have enough soil moisture uh, to grow a crop. And we need help. And the only help that we are going to get is if there is a drought emergency declared. And so it still took between the meetings of various committees and some other things occurring, it took over a month for the state to declare drought emergency and uh, effectively enact some things that would help wheat growers and other folks uh, get some relief that they needed. I, I liked um, the recommendation because it's one of those common sense things that you know people there's processes that people get used to and that's the way it, that they do things and they don't take a step back to say you know could we do this better if we suspect if there's a high likelihood that there's a drought and you have you know two committees that have to meet you know and usually there's the span of weeks between them why not have them meet at the same time if it's and that way you can better prepare for agriculture and I would assume there would be a forestry management portion of that, at least for, for uh, forest fires and other things that you'd want to get prepped for. So, you know, it, I, th I thought that was a good common sense kind of, uh, kind of approach and, and worth bringing up. There was one other issue I wanted to tackle with you. Um, you're going to uh, post a blog on, on this, you know, within, well, within a day or so, or maybe even today. And that was um, the effort to try to improve mental health in the agriculture community. You've pointed out a number of times that, that um, farmers particularly uh, have been heavy hit by high suicide rates and, uh, and there's a high need for uh, mental health um, there. And there's a new um, helpline that's come out. Why don't you describe the helpline and your role in that here in Washington State? Sure. So uh, in 2020, Congress uh, enacted legislation to shorten the um, one 800 uh, National Suicide and Crisis Prevention Hotline from its 800 number down to 988. So similar to everyone knowing that when there's an emergency, you call 911, the idea was effectively to make 988 the new version of, if you have a mental health or, or suicidal person, you call 988 instead of trying to remember the, um, the national talk line. Uh, states were tasked with effectively putting together some sort of support system for this 988 line. There are some problems with it, however. Um, the most notable being most everyone has moved away from a landline system in their homes, particularly younger people. And 
the 988 system still relies on an area code as your primary form of figuring out where you are going to have a response from. So if you have an area code that is outside of your state, when you call 988, you are going to be routed to where your area code originates from. This is problematic if, for example, you have an area code from, say, South Dakota, and you live in Washington. Because when you call 988 and you are having a mental health crisis, you are going to have someone from South Dakota answer the phone. This is even more problematic in cases of suicide and mental health because there is a 10 minute or less window for that operator to change your mind and try to save your life. You're not going to get help in person in 10 minutes from South Dakota in Washington state. So um, we've been working on trying to fix that uh, I've reached out to the FCC several times. Um, if there's anybody from the FCC listening, I'd happily talk with you um, about why this is problematic. Um, also, I think there's some other issues that come along with that. Agriculture is a really insular community uh, um, and it poses some really difficult challenges. If you're not from an agricultural background or an agricultural community, uh, it's difficult for you to answer questions about how to help someone who is not like you. Just like um, a mom can't talk to a non-mom about um, the stresses of being a mom or a bus driver or uh, a garbage collector or anything else. There are things that are really specific to your job that are unique and it's not different in agriculture. The difference is that the intersection between high risk people in the United States are that they are generally middle-aged white men. In agriculture, those are the people who run farms by and large. So you have those two people together and that's where you get the highest incidences of suicide in the United States next to people who are of Native American descent. Let's go to a couple of questions. Uh, Clifford Mass uh, says, there's been deep flaws in this in the claims of drought. This spring, there were claims of extreme drought when it did not exist. Any comments there, Pam? So uh, Cliff is right, but I do think the one thing that we miss out on, particularly in the ag side of things, is that we forget about soil moisture. And I talk about that in the paper too. Um, when you're looking at dryland farming in particular, soil moisture recovery and recharge is something that we don't talk about a whole lot. And oftentimes when we have deep drought like we've had previously over the last few years, looking at that deep moisture content that's anywhere from six to 12 or even 18 inches down matters. So it doesn't really matter how much rainfall you get or how much snowfall you get, it matters how much moisture is actually in the soil because that determines what sort of germination you're going to get long term. So I think we need to have a longer discussion about how we can incorporate those two things, both surface and subsurface moisture, to make sure that they're working in concert when we're talking about drought declarations. Next question is from Jason. He asks, what's the benefit of declaring a drought emergency? Committees can't make more rain, so why is there an ag benefit to declaring a drought? So that's a great question. Um, so when you declare a drought emergency, what it does is unlock a number of things that agriculture folks can access. Things like being able to move their water rights temporarily for the year later in the year than they would normally be able to. So if you have a, access to a well or something else, you can transfer that water right to another field that needs it more. The other thing that you can do is access emergency funds either through the USDA or, or WSDA to help offset um, you know, potential crop death because it's just too dry. Well, thanks, Pam. Appreciate you being on the program today on the agenda. I wanna remind people, Pam, uh, Pam's study on uh, the drought situation comes out tomorrow. So you'll be able to check that out, washingtonpolicy.org and get that inf information.
Thanks, ma'am. Thanks, Dave. Next up is Lee Finna. She is our Center for Education Director, and uh, Leif is the recipient of a complaint <laughs> from OSPI uh, because uh, she called out um, the Superintendent Reichdahl on, uh, on calling for an end to, um, to the student uh, learning assessment here. Leif, um, why don't you describe you know, what you heard the superintendent say and, and why you blogged what you did? Well, last week, the State Board of Education had a meeting at which Chris Reichdahl, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, the top education official in the state, made the statement in response to a question about the plummeting test scores. One of the State Board of Education members asked about these bad test scores that have come out on the uh, state test. And I heard the superintendent say, and it's all recorded, so there's no issue, uh, that these test scores are being misconstrued. They're not as bad as they seem. Uh, they, besides which, they're not important. They have no meaning. And he's looking at a way to exit from the test. And so I reported that. And, you, and I provided the link to, his, to the recording of his statement. And then the, then the next thing I knew was I was being called dishonest, not reporting the truth, uh, right wing, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what happens to you know, honest reporters too often in this, in this environment that we're in. You report the facts and then you're called names. If, yeah. Let me, let me pause you right there and I'll share my screen because I, I took the liberty of, of posting the superintendent's comments, uh, a few clips of them on the Washington Policy Center YouTube channel. You know, I, I put the full five, six minutes on there uh, of, of this particular exchange. Obviously, I'm not going to play all of that right now. Um, the, the muffled audio that you hear, that's not us. That's, that's the, the poor quality of the uh, I think it's his microphone uh, that he's using, but you'll be able to, to hear it well enough. I'm gonna share uh, my screen here. Let me go out to, um, uh, let me see what I can grab here. But we'll grab first the um, superintendent's um, uh, comments about seeking authority to, um, uh, to cancel the test here. Let me grab that. In. We've got to start talking about what the law is in that larger state. And obviously, you know, it's time to start saying, isn't it interesting that despite people sort of legending us from the right wing for the false sort of framing of test scores, higher ends never believed them. <laughs> higher ends never accepted that smarter balanced means were in the event. In fact, they've now dumped SAT, ACT in other places. They're into transcript evaluation. What classes did you take? Are you passionate? Do you have a commitment to learning? Do you have self-discipline? Like the things that have always mattered to employers in the world still matter. And the thing we keep experimenting with tests, smarter balance, and the course, the wassail, that keeps coming and going because it actually means nothing except to the people who want to beat up public education and they frame it wrong every time. And we work, we contribute to that with this simple four, three, two, one scale. It's really, really broken. It's done most states have abandoned this stuff. Uh, we're still clinging to the consortium of smarter balance. I don't know how much longer that should last. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I have the authority to exodus on my own or if that means something else. Um, but we've got to have a smarter conversation to contextualize, like you said, in the report card, what it means for student achievement outside of a 4 3 2 one test. Okay, so I think that gives people some proper context, but, but you'll note there he says, um, the, the smarter balance, the wassail. Um, I'm sure uh, most of you know me. My name is Marissa. Uh, uh, I'm the professional sorry. program at the Washington got, Policy. Got Marissa popping up on me here. Um, but there's, he, he actually uses a number of different tests. He doesn't just stick to one uh, when he's talking about that, um, uh, about, about looking for authority to get us out of that, that testing. Yes. Remember, he said, you were about to say that. He said, the, smart, the end of course, the smarter balance, the wassail. All of those tests mean nothing. And that is why I seek to exit from these tests. So I just reported that. And you heard what he said. And, you know, so then I'm called names. And it's, it's just, 
it, it just shows up. I, you, you have to wonder why the name calling comes so quickly in this context. I mean, this is the state superintendent of public instruction was one of the leaders that helped the schools stay closed for the longest period of time in state history, nearly two years, kept the schools closed during COVID. There's been dr dramatic damage, plummeting test scores. And maybe he doesn't want discussion about that. I mean, that's, that's a distraction, you know, a distraction. How do we, how do we distract? We, we call names. I mean, it's very disappointing from this leader. It, if he's truly serious about facing the reality of what the children in our state face. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the answers comes from uh, the, just a bad habit among general political conversation these days is, is instead of addressing the issue in front of you, you try to attack the people that are saying it so that no one has to listen to them and you don't have to address their concerns. In this case, it's you know, it's right wing. It's somebody else. He actually started. If you watch the five minute clip, he actually starts by saying the whole world is pummeling these test scores. That's, I'm paraphrasing, but he uses the phrase the whole world is pummeling. And then then he goes off at the end. It's the right wing that's that's using these, these test scores because they're poor. But and, and he does say that they don't matter. Uh, but he also tries to explain Lee, that what we're really looking at is maybe, you know, a bunch of kids that were in the three category, maybe drop down to the two, some fours drop down to the threes. And it really doesn't mean that much. It's not the A, B, C, D, F. It's, you know, threes and uh, fours are still going to college. In fact, twos are going to college with a little remedial. Um, so there's really nothing, nothing to see here, so to speak. Can you address at all what, what he's saying about what this test actually measures and whether or not that's an honest assessment of what this ass assessment tool is supposed to measure. Well, notice that he doesn't talk about the test scores before the, the uh, schools were closed for two years. I mean, notice that and, and notice that he's uh, uh, speaking of, <laughs> he said, he said, t he said 10% of our kids went from three, which is a passing score to a two and that does not really matter well 10 percent of our kids do matter for for one thing and it shows actually that the scores in math have always been bad so they start out from a very bad baseline 50 percent have been passed and failing in the past now we have 70 percent failing in math and so notice how he doesn't talk about the actual baseline numbers and what they represent so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a screen, it's a, there's nothing to see here argument. Uh, if, if the test means nothing, why are we giving the test to every child? Obviously they do mean something. They're an important signal of what the schools fail to do for children during COVID. And there's been, there's been a dramatic drop, you know, from bad to worse. And you would think that this top state school official would be talking about that not calling me names. And, and I love your point about, you know, everyone is bludging me and then now it's just the right wing that is bludging me. I mean, that's a great point. Yeah, and, and you know, poll numbers show in Washington state, the right wing is not very popular. So, you know, you toss that in there and people can say, oh, it's just, it's just complaints there. But the problem is you have this objective, um, you know, these numbers and the numbers don't have a political ideology next to them. So. It's tough to explain, so the, so the you know the easiest way to do that is just dismiss everybody, um, and, and that was unfortunate. The other thing you know that that's uh, a problem here is when he's saying that they don't matter. He says what we you know what what colleges care about, what higher ed cares about, what employer cares about is the passion of students and whether or not they you know they took a, a hard caseload. And I mean, I never had an employer ever go through my um, <laughs> my my high school or college class load and see which classes I took or anything of the kind. Um, but that's also, a, a, most of that stuff is very, very subjective. There's not, you know, trying to get some assessment where you're measuring a student's passion for learning is going to be rough. Uh, let, let's face well, it. Well, that's, that's it, a great point. I mean, this is what, if you look at the broader, uh, broader picture of what's been happening here, this uh, state superintendent, remember during COVID, called for an end to failing grades. And he, at, two years ago, told John Carlson on his radio show that uh, in the future, we're gonna get rid of failing grades. So we are, the, this, the, the notions that are being pushed by the state superintendent are to reduce rigor 
and accountability for actual results. And the tests, it, unfortunately, as, as uh, limiting as tests are, they do provide the only objective measure of actual uh, gaining of knowledge and skills. And that's what we pay the school $17 billion a year to provide. And, and they're slowly taking away any kind of objective measure. And the tests represent that objective measure. All the rest is subjective. And you know, measuring the passion of, of a student for learning, you know, for goodness sakes, the world is a tough place. You have to know how to fly an airplane. You need to, you need to know how to do your basic math. If you're going to be an air, airline pilot, are you going to be graded on your passion for flying? Or are you going to be graded on your mastery of the, of the controls of flying a plane? You know, the, the, we, we cannot uh, uh, misinform our children about the, the, the um, challenges of living in the real world. And they involve being able to master basic math facts and basic English knowledge if you're going to succeed. And so I, I find it very dis disheartening to, to see this effort to lower standards, lower, they're lowering academic standards in Washington state, uh, slowly but surely getting rid of failing grades. Now they're talking about getting rid of the smarter balance test, which of course then allows them the exit of not being able to be compared for results of a trend line over time. They do this. They change the test every ten years or so because they don't want to be. Sh they don't want people like me to say, "Hey, look, look, uh, the kids are doing worse than you know in 2022 than they were doing in 2000." Change the test, then no one can make that comparison. It's very, it's very uh, convenient for them. So yeah, you keep changing it around. They don't have to keep track. I, I do want to share another clip from uh, Reichdahl, if I may, here, Lee. Um, this is uh, part of the extended. Uh, clip. I, obviously, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I, I just wanted to uh, play this and, and get your take on it a little bit. Assessments, because the whole world comes down around this thing, right? And they get it so wrong. When you graduate 80,000 kids a year, virtually all of them end up in the post secondary or in the labor market earning 14 or 20 bucks an hour. You just became the second highest ranking state in the nation in economic activity, the number six in livability. Like, we're doing a lot. But if all you did was look at smarter balance scores and you say, well, some students are a four and some are a three and some are a two and some are a one, and boy, doesn't that look terrible? Because people want to think of it as an A through D or an A through F rating scale. It's just not that. Okay, I wanted to pause that because one of the things he says is we're already at a success because we graduate kids. And when they do, they either go to college or they go out to the uh, uh, world of work here. And you know, they're earning you know, 14 or more dollars an hour. Well, what's the minimum wage in Washington State? dollars an hour i mean it's it was just funny to me because um yes you know it's, it's a bit over 14 and you know and he's saying you know they can't be under they can't be paid less than that right i mean that's that's not a, a victory to to uh, hoist your flag on um there, so, well it's so. it's it's just it's such sloppy comparisons i mean uh the, if you really want to see what the uh state of washington's public schools are doing no less than if you if you manage to get graduate from high school and you go to community college, fifty percent of the kids do not graduate from community college, where and do not earn an associate degree. We are we are so poorly preparing our high school kids for higher education that we're ranked forty sixth in the nation on that metric. So let's talk about real apples to apples comparison instead of these broad, everything is great and hunky dory in Washington state. Of course, we import a lot of our talent from other states. They're getting better educations in other states that the, the computer scientists that come here, they're being imported. So, because we're not doing a great job educating our own children here. And part of the reason is that we are all about, oh, show us your passion, show us your, you know, your, your uh, commitment to learning which of course is completely subjective. Now they're, now they're just gonna want to move to a system where children are recommended to college based on, on uh, grades given by their teachers and they won't be able to have any Fs on their, on their records. So we're lowering, you know, lowering standards carefully all out of the supposed compassion for the student. It's not compassionate to lower standards and tell them that they, don't need to learn and, and work hard in school and, and get the basic essentials that they need to succeed. No, you're absolutely right. And it causes all kinds of hardships later on. 
and a lot of social dysfunction that costs uh, taxpayers again, you know, even after you, you have record amounts of, of funding coming in. And, uh, uh, but if you have people left without opportunity, that tends to uh, increase, you know, the need for social services that uh, tends to increase Absolutely. the li likelihood of uh, criminal acts and other things. And it's just not fair to, uh, to the people that are seeing their potential snubbed uh, early on. Um, there's two comments I wanted to address real quickly. Uh, people complaining about the audio. I warned you, it's not us. It's the, it's the microphone of the superintendent of public instruction. Um, it's, it's just bad all the way around. So you can watch it. it you'll probably... Maybe you'll be able to hear it a little bit easier if you go to the WashingtonPolicy.org, uh, or, or the, sorry, the Washington Policy um, YouTube channel, or just go to Leaf's blog. It's um, the relevant clip. I embedded it in her blog, so you can watch it there yourself. The other thing, Leaf, that we never got to, and, and I didn't tell you we were going to uh, mention it, but he also went on about salaries and the need to boost salaries, including administrative salaries in the same, same piece, saying that, well, since we raised salaries here by uh, 30 some odd percent in the past uh, four years, and we're going to try to boost those significantly uh, higher. Well, now the administrators of the buildings, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're too close to what the teachers are making. So we need to, um, we need to boost those salaries. We're going to push that with it. And then, you know, of course, that's going, I mean, I take it, it will keep just going up because the more you yeah. push up. The, uh, yeah, that more. was a very interesting point. Yeah. That's great. You Thanks for bringing that up, Dave, because he admitted uh, in response to a question from one of the State Board of Education members that the teacher salaries have increased by 30% in the last five years. And that's what he was talking about, that, 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 that now that teachers make on average $90,000 uh, in salary plus another $30,000 in uh, benefits, that the, that the teachers are getting paid well. And that is putting pressure on the administrators who are doing all this extra work, blah, blah, blah. We have to get, pay them more. Well, that's exactly the, the union scale. You know, that's the way they think. Central planning, everyone has to be paid exactly the same, regardless of their performance. And so, you know, of course, we at the Washington Policy Center think that teachers should be paid more, but it should be done on the basis of merit. Good teachers paid a lot more. They deserve a lot more pay. Uh, but when, you're, when you have to spread the, mo the money across these uh, categories of, of uh, staff, duty duty uh, categories, uh, then you, you, you can, you're, you're not going to be able to pay t the really good teachers more because you have to pay the administrators more. I just think that's a completely fallacious way to run a, a school system because, and, and it doesn't provide what every child needs and that is the best possible teacher in their classroom. Yeah, he, he was uh, particularly, um, you know, they, they say in politics that um, a gaffe is when you speak honestly in public. And, um, and it was interesting because he, he used words like, we're looking for a ton of money. You know, that's not something that you usually get from somebody who's seeking tax dollars in the midst of, you know, a high inflationary time. Uh, you just don't hear comments like that very often. But That's a good like point. This. Yes. That, in fact, it reflects that they have been looking and gotten a ton of money in the past. That, that we're not going to we're not going to look for a ton of money going forward, like the ton of money we already got. Well, I think it's it's it preposterous that the that that the these administrators who we, he claims they need to be paid so much can't write a budget that they can keep within. <laughs> They, they, so if, if they're worth every dollar that's being paid, then they shouldn't be coming for a ton or even more money. It should just be done on an inflationary basis, you know, in, increase or decrease in enrollment. Uh, and uh, that's not the way the public school administrators in Washington state behave. They, they write the budgets they want. If they don't have enough money, they go and demand more money from the state legislature. So, you know. It, is, it's, it was a really interesting meeting with horrible audio. I'm thinking about sending one of my old microphones over to OSBI so they can outfit this guy's desk with uh, well, something, yeah. something a little more appropriate. For sure. It's, uh, it's you know, with the amount of money coming in, you've got to have some better office <laughs> office microphones there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, this one here was that I'm using was 200 bucks. I mean, come on. I agree. I agree. Every single, yeah, you couldn't hear the questions. For, I struggled to listen, but I got, I got all the words from the, but it's hard to hear what the State Board of Education members were saying. It was hard for him to hear what he was saying. They can do better than that, but they should really be focusing on what do these failing test scores mean and what are they going to do 
for these children. We have one chance to educate this group of 1.1 million children. We should be focusing on that. Those test scores are a canary in the gold mine, in the coal mine of a warning of danger, danger, danger. And what are we doing about that? I think we need to face that reality and not call names to people that are reporting on the facts. Well, with all the money talk, maybe it is a canary in the gold mine. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> There's um, a couple of questions here. One from Martin, as public school attendance goes down, are we seeing any reduction in administrative staffing at the state level? I don't see any reduction in administrative staffing at the state level. We'll see if there's any reduction whatsoever. Remember in last session, they, they, they pr provided another $360 million to fill empty seats from the student enrollment loss. Uh, so, you know, the decline is real. That is another thing they didn't talk about at the State Board of Education. Why aren't, they, why aren't they talking about why parents are pulling their kids out of the public schools? I mean, the Seattle Times surprisingly reported that, that the Bellevue public school system has seen a 9.7% decline in student enrollment, 10%. Bellevue public schools, supposedly the best in our state. The parents are so disgusted by what's going on over there. They're pulling their kids out and putting them in private school or homeschooling. Same thing happening in Seattle. 7.9 percent have pulled their kids out. This is this is a financial crisis for the schools. But why is this happening? Why are they not reflecting on what they are failing to do? Maybe they should be thinking about not indoctrinating children in this critical race theory nonsense. Maybe they should be thinking about strengthening the teaching in actual math and reading. <laughs> That's what a rational person would do, given the people pulling their kids out of the schools. Next question is from Donald. He says, I'm convinced the state colleges are covering for the public schools by accepting less qualified and less educated students. I assume they're doing this because of lack of education funding during COVID and not wanting to lose money due to a decline in enrollment. They eliminated some of the testing requirements for admissions. So Reichdahl and company get to point to admission admittance numbers. When can we get school choice and the majority of the money following the student? Well, that's a great point. They did lower admissions requirements. They played all kinds of games during COVID. And I'm not surprised if they did that as well. Uh, in terms of school choice, there are there were four bills introduced by lawmakers last session. Very exciting. Uh, there they there were ranging from ten thousand dollars per student to sixty two hundred and fifty dollars per student. I'm hearing that these bills will be reintroduced in the next session. But but one of the best pieces of news on this front is the Supreme Court decision in Carson, which basically made our Blaine Amendment that blocks school choice. Uh, ineffective, okay? We no longer have a Blaine Amendment prohibiting money from going to private schools. So if parents, the intervening, there's an intervening parent deciding to send public money to a private school. So, you know, that remaining, that, that legal obstacle has now been removed and I, and parents are upset. They are upset. And, and I'm seeing this in, in um, polls. There was a Gallup poll released yesterday uh, saying that the confidence in the public schools has really dropped. I mean, something like 28%. And I'm seeing other polls uh, showing real, dis real loss of confidence in our public education system. And really the best way to strengthen our public schools is to pass a school choice bill because that will bring the, you know, the cleansing forces of competition upon these school administrators who, who still uh, you know, Dave, I saw, I'm seeing on Twitter, they're still begging for supplies. And in fact, today, the Seattle Times has an article saying, oh, our, our, our hard working teachers deserve your help in providing supplies, school supplies to the opening of the school in the, in the fall. We have $18,000 per student on average statewide. Seattle Public Schools has $22,000 per student. And they can't provide supplies to the teachers, please. That's yeah, outrageous. It's, it's very strange. Uh, I noticed that well, last year, actually, when, when there was talk about supplies, I thought, wait a second. I'm, I'm aware of the increase in education funding, uh, as well as the property taxes that people are paying. Um, you know, at some point, doesn't the situation get solved? Next question. Do we have any academic requirements for public high school graduation? Um, test scores, approved competency, et cetera. Do we have any academic requirements? Well, there there are requirements, but there's what they're doing is creating um, many more pathways to graduation that avoid those requirements. That's what the State Board of Education is considering now. 
They're trying to create a work a pathway and alternate pathways. Now, it, it uh, we, I am not a huge, you know, uh, proponent of of uh, one size fits all standards for graduating from high school because there is no one size fits all high school student, but they do need to have a bare minimum of academic knowledge in reading and math in order to succeed in college or in the trades after high school. And I, I do think we have to maintain that bare minimum of expectation or, or the schools really are, are disturbing the students by not preparing them for what lies ahead in their lives. Then a final point, it's interesting when people uh, like Reichdahl and others, when, when they talk about the public schools and you're talking about, hey, there's evidence that all these children were harmed, there's, their learning was harmed, this is a problem. And you've done that before with the schools that received self-identified failing grades. It wasn't WPC labeling them as failing, it was the state themselves labeling them as failing. And we know that the links between lack of opportunity, the decline in wages and job yeah. loss, all kinds of problems that come with that. The, the, the sympathy is, hey, the system here, how dare you criticize the, sim- the s- system, which wasn't working. Instead of being sympathetic to the purpose of public education, which is to educate children. So they're not focused on you know, the actual reason for the existence of the system. They're focused yeah. on the, protecting the system itself, which is, which is uh, nutty when you think about it. it it's, um, you're exactly right. It's all about protecting a very well-funded public school system that provides lots of jobs and uh, gives power to special interests in education. It's really all about that. It always, it just boiling down to that. And we really need to shift the focus back on getting every child the education they are, are entitled to receive under the constitution. Our constitution says it's a paramount duty to provide for the education of, ch- of every child with, residing within our borders, not to fund a uh, ever, ever how do, how do I put this, a system that is simply not accountable to the public. All right, next um, we've got, uh, Lee, thanks so much for the time. I know you've got to run off and, and uh, pay attention to the Superintendent of Public Construction's um, press conference uh, today. Thank you, Dave, so appreciate watching, it. Watching that Thank on you. TVW Facebook. Thank you. Let's get Jason Rissier on board. He is our Center for Government Reform Director. And Jason, you know, one of the things that you've been writing about is the, the, um, the negotiations that are ongoing right now with the governor and public employee unions uh, based on their their compensation packages that that he is uh, negotiating. Now, keep in mind, these are the same organizations that contributed heavily to his election. And uh, frequently, politicians will say, I'm on the side of the very people they're supposed to be um, across the table from, you know, adversarial to, so to speak, you know, but but they seem to be wanting to sit on both sides of the table. So, you know, explain what's going on with the governor right now and why we don't know what it is exactly. Yeah, thank you, Dave. So every two years in, when the governor is starting to put together his budget, and this fall he'll be putting together the 2023-25 state budget, coinciding with that, he engages in these secret contract talks with state employee unions, who, as you indicated, happen to be regularly campaign donors. There is no disclosure. There is no fiscal scoring. There is no information. I can't tell you right now how many hundreds of millions of dollars are on the table. I can't tell you what the union is asking for and what the governor is offering, what those trade-offs are. And I won't be able to tell you a single thing until they shake hands and make an agreement and announce they have a deal. And at that point, the legislature's hands are tied. They can't make any changes to this financial package of compensation. All they can do is say yes or no, which basically means the very first buy in the state budget is going to be these hundreds of millions of dollars of pay raises negotiated behind closed doors with campaign contributors. Without, without the participation of the people who are elected to control the state purse, so to speak. Every other budget decision is made in the public legislative process where all advocates for spending, whatever the priorities are, get to go to the legislature in a public process make the pitch for why they should get a certain amount of funding. With this exception, this is the, this is apparently is the most important buy for the state of Washington that cannot be bothered with that prioritization and that legislative review. And I guess my frustration is this is relatively new. 
Washington has only been doing this since 2004. Prior to that, the budget compensation, it was all part of the public legislative process. But that changed with a bill the legislature passed in 2002. And this really isn't how it's done in most of the other states across the country. Even if you have negotiation with the government for contracts, it's usually on what's called non-economic issues, right? Your work conditions. And in fact, one of those, you may have heard the governor is now saying for now and until the end of time, you're going to be required to be vaccinated and have boosters to be employed by the state of Washington. Well, that's a work condition. That is subject to negotiation. They're negotiating that right now. But the economic issues, things that cost taxpayers money, pay, compensation, bonuses, that should be part of the public legislative budget process. Yeah, it's, it's uh, amazing. How did we get to this point where, um, where they could keep these things in secret? And why did the legislature give up their role in negotiating one of the, well, the biggest one ticket item that, uh, you know, that comes before them? So beware the legislative deal. Right before 2002, it had actually been illegal for the state of Washington to competitively contract out services traditionally done by public employees. Right, so if you could go out to bid and get a service, whether it's cleaning the highways, whatever it might be, cheaper, you couldn't do that if it was traditionally done by a union employee. So, what the Republicans said in 2002 is, well, let's get rid of this ban on competitive bidding so we can actually get go out and see what's the best value for this public service. And for a long time, the Democrats had wanted the governor to be able to negotiate paying wages without the legislature. And supposedly this deal was reached that we'll go ahead and give the governor negotiating power in exchange for competitive bidding because that should offset the costs. Well, that deal hasn't exactly materialized as it was envisioned when it was struck back in 2002. And instead now we don't have a lot of contracting out of services and we have the situation where the governor is making hundreds of millions of dollars of commitments without any transparency. It's strange because it feels like in any other context, this would be an ethics violation. If you, you know, were the one person negotiating with people, you know, on, on whom your job relies on, you know, the, this is, these are the, the, the power, political power brokers of the state. They're showering your campaign with, uh, with money in order to stay in the office that you hold. And then you're the only one negotiating with them in a non-public way to determine what their, uh, what their wages and, and benefits will be. Um, that's that's a, a pretty brutal. Here's a question from Tom. He says, a friend of mine is getting a three-part raise, a step increase, a cost of living adjustment. Um, another adjustment is 2,500 to 3,500. Uh, and that's another, that brings up a good point, which is oftentimes when we hear about raises, we forget there's built-in raises that are there with for time and experience um, in, in state government very often. So people get increases whether something happens or not. Yeah, so when you, unless you're at what's called the very top of the wage scale, every year you do get a what's called a step increase for that time for continuing employment, for moving up into other positions. So when you hear announcements that the governor has reached a deal on a pay increase, that's a resetting of the wage scale. That's just bumping that up across the board. So as that questioner pointed out, unless you're at the top of the wage scale, you're going to get step increases every year. And sometimes there are uh, not bonuses, but if you're at uh, something that they've been adding in recent years, if you're at the lower end, they've been trying to target some of those increases to the lower end of the scale, which makes sense for competitiveness reasons. Uh, quick question here. Is there any data about numbers, numbers of government employees that are opting out of union membership? You, you know, know. Uh, Elizabeth Hovde might have the information, our, our labor director. I don't have that at the top of my head. I do know that with the, the Janus situation, you are no longer required to be a member of uh, a union member for allowed to have a job. Um, and that is kind of another interesting situation that comes up, not only with the, the vaccine mandate with these pay raises, these are just going to be for the union employees. And there's no obligation that the governor give non-union non -union employees the same type of pay raise. But since there's not a contract there, the legislature can make adjustments. And what the legislature has done thus far is whatever raise they give the union employees, they've also given to the non-union employees. There's an interesting, um, well, I, I know there's some technical aspects as to why they do that, but I'll wait for the labor uh, uh, center director to, to input on that. But, but there's an interesting phenomenon that goes on there as well, which is they, um, they put together these, these packages, uh, these increases, and uh, it's, it's all done in secret. And yet 
Um, the public widely supports transparency in these negotiations. It's not a partisan um, uh, issue. Um, I know there, there's, there's critics that will say it is, but um, overwhelmingly these kinds of things, like in Spokane, uh, on a local level, collective bargaining transparency passed with, what was it, Jason, 72%? I think it's 76%. Oh, 76%, geez. And, uh, you know, while you might think about well, Spokane, Eastern Washington, you know, Spokane is represented, you know, by Democrats for the most part in the um, Senate and the legislature. It's, it's a very, you know, it's a little, uh, a, a little mini Western Washington in the heart of uh, Eastern Washington in many ways. So it's, it's not... You know, it's not the typical kind of uh, hard uh, Republican part of, uh, of Eastern Washington. Um, and, and then uh, also for the negotiations and the, and the pay raises there, and, um, we, sh we can remember while people have the, the uh, ability to opt out of the union, they're not reminded of it as often as they are their uh, supposed obligation to join it, you know, because the union gets a special treatment as far as they can do their selling pitch and they can, uh, they have access to all the, you know, your, your, they can contact the public employees, you know, at, and, and they're given special time, uh, including time on the clock to make that, that pitch. There's, there's nothing there anywhere close that, that reminds people they have the, uh, the right uh, to opt out without financial consequence. Um, for dues and fees. So, you know, that's, that's a struggle as, as well. Jason, I, I did want to spend some time on uh, updating people on the Supreme Court case, or I should say the court case, now Supreme Court case, regarding the uh, income tax on capital gains. Uh, you want to provide the update on that and what it means? Yeah, and if you don't mind, Dave, before we do that, I just want to close the loop on the contracts. As we're the policy center, we're not the lining center. So we actually have a couple of recommendations on how to fix this. Great point. Great point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the most simplest being, open the doors so that people can see what is actually happening. That's why I brought up Spokane. It's like there's a exactly. real simple. You, know, yeah. you should actually go back to how things were prior to 2004, that non-economic issues the governor can have a hand at, but economic issues, anything requiring appropriation should be back in the public legislative process. And if you can't do those two things, just the simplest thing you can do, just post publicly the offers exchanging hands. Because right now I have a little calendar reminder in December to do a public records request to find out after the fact what's been agreed to. I can't get any of that though until the deal is done and that, that just shouldn't happen. But to your question about the capital gains income tax, we do have an update. Uh, you may recall an Inslee appointed judge ruled the tax unconstitutional and valid void. If you've been following our work, that's not a surprise because this is not a debate anywhere in the world. It's an income tax and this was a graduated income tax, which is unconstitutional. The attorney general wanted to skip the Court of Appeals and ask the Supreme Court of the state of Washington to take direct review. And just last week, the Supreme Court accepted that. So that means potentially in November, but more likely early January or February, the state Supreme Court will hear all arguments on this case. And this is probably the simplest case they're gonna be looking at because it's something they've already looked at multiple times over the past hundred years. And all that we're being asked here is, do we own our income? Because if you own your income, it's property. And as the Supreme Court reminded the legislature in 1960, if you want to graduate an income tax on property, you've got to amend the Constitution. And that's because our state constitution says we own our property, tangible and intangible. Um, so it's an extremely broad definition of, of property there. So I like how you've boiled this down to, do you own your income or do you not own your income? Um, because it makes it much harder, much harder for people to advocate. And, and, and you know, it's not like this was a one-off ruling or a one-off vote. The voters, the legislatures actually managed to send the voters six constitutional amendments to change that, to say that yeah. income isn't property. And the voters have rejected those. So six constitutional amendments, 100 years of case law. I don't even know why we're having this debate again. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for attending. Jason, thank you for being a part of Washington Policy on the Go. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. In the meantime, check out our newsletter every Friday. It's easy to sign up. It's right there on the homepage, washingtonpolicy.org, or any of our blogs. Uh, if you go to the main homepage, just go all the way to the top of the screen, and you can see the sign up for the newsletter. And be sure to tell your friends, interested colleagues, and family members about that as well. They can keep up on the latest in-state policy. And if you're not a member, if you've been kind of uh, on the bench and thinking about getting involved, maybe not sure, hey, it's easy to join Washington Policy Center and help us get these messages out and the information out uh, to the people who need to know. You can join for as little as $5 a month, be a monthly giver. 
um, just go to WashingtonPolicy.org. There's a donate tab there and, uh, and you can find out all about it. Thanks again for being with us and we'll see you in two weeks.